Now I'd like to just get some hands up. Who here prescribes drugs or medications? Who, how many prescribers have we got in the room? And how many dispensers have we got in the room? Well, pretty much half half, I reckon. And there's, and there's a few others that don't do either of those roles, but um, they'll be introduced if they're appropriate to what we're talking about later on. Okay, so um, I'd like to take you back to a story. Samantha. And this is in the future, but let's pretend it's today. Samantha woke up and she had her breakfast. Samantha's pharmacist woke up and went to work and didn't get a call from the police. Samantha's doctor woke up and went to work and hadn't had a call from the coroner. Samantha survived because both the pharmacist and the doctor had information that allowed a conversation so that she woke up and everyone's lives went on normally. This program is designed to save lives like Samantha's, but we'll never know because our lives go on normally. There's no police call, there's no coroner's call. There is no alert to say we save the life. So we want to avoid those situations, but we, don't, we won't see the rewards because life goes on. And I want to bring back to what Angelo mentioned at the start. This program is not about us. We are part of the cogs between a patient's distress of some sort, pain or anxiety or insomnia generally, and a potential overdose. Most of them absolutely unintended. 40% of them as prescribed without any aberrancy of behaviours. This is coroner's data from our patients, our community. Most of them prescription medications, not illicitly sourced. Currently more people die in Victoria of that situation than the road toll. And we are mere cogs in that thing. We have a strong responsibility, but this program is not about us. We control the decision making and it's, it's a tool to assist us. So I'm going to come back to that message. It's about prevention of overdose. And it's a tool to assist us with our decision making so that we can make things as safe as possible for the Samantha's as we see. It won't stop all overdoses. It's not designed to do that because it can't. Because not all the overdoses are caused by lack of clinical information. But many of them have been because we've been prescribing and dispensing blind. Up to this point, I don't know what on earth Samantha's been getting and taking, apart from her own history and some sort of vague PBS three months ago history that if I thought about ringing up, I might get some information, but it wasn't that accurate. We've been prescribing and dispensing blind. From now on, you'll have real-time information that allows you to make cleverer, hopefully cleverer, clinical decisions. But the responsibility for the prescribing and dispensing is still our responsibility. This is just the tool as an information source. So this first part here, we're going to go through some of the logistics. We'll go back to another case in a second and look at a bit more about the, that interface and explore parts that we may want to use. We'll look at some of the rules, some of the different contexts where there's exemptions and hospitals and how they work. We'll talk you through all that. And then towards the end of the session, we're going to talk a bit more tr problematic stuff where Safe Trips gives us an alert. What do we do about that? Where we're seeing dangerous prescribing, not just prescribing and dispensing, but it's da dangerous situations for the patients. And how do we respond to that when we go into Safe Trips and find that information? And we'll guide you through that together. So we'll come back to our our case. This is April's history before we get onto the thing. Now, not most, most of it's not that relevant to us really because we're looking at how it comes about. But we haven't, as a GP, this is a GP case study, but, um, but we haven't seen her for a while. Um, and last time we saw her, 12 months ago, we prescribed some clinical, um, some um, benzos. Now, this is not about the clinical relevance of prescribing benzos and what was going on. This is purely about using safe scripts. So I know we can pick apart what someone would have done, let's, let's move on from their clinical parts of things. So we're going to look at Safe Scripts. So she's going to see us. And as Angela was mentioning, there's two ways to get into Safe Scripts. If through our software, we get a notification, we can click and we'll come straight immediately to this page. If I haven't seen her, I know she's in the waiting room, but in the software, I haven't done anything yet, then I won't get a notification yet. And so I can go on to the previous page, the search page, which is where, as I sign into SafeScripts, comes up with this, and you can put her details in directly, and it'll come up to that main page. 
So it's a notification shortcut, otherwise manually you can enter this. And just to reiterate, um, so a tip for me, from me, Safe Scripts, apart from the registration process to verify who you are, each day you need to have a two-stage login. There's the daily login, which requires a two-stage authentication, that the, the phone app, put your number in, verify it's you type of thing, like your bank. So that's done once a day. And you get your mini password for the day you put in. So I put in a quick code that I can always put in and remember all the time. From there on, whenever I see a patient, because it logs out within about two minutes, every time I see a new patient and I want to check, it's just the quick code, it's not the whole phone saga. So my tip for you is get used to at the start of every day, while you log in and you get your software booted up and everything's cranking up and getting going, one more step, get SafeScripts logged in. The little mini code at the start of the day. So that way when you do see a Samantha or Jeremy or whoever it may be, it's not like, oh, they get the phone out and took the thing, too much time. It's basically, I'm in, quick code and bang, it's like we have here. So whenever we come back to this, this is a log out, we're gonna, um, if we go to the pharmacist one, it's logged out. No, well, it hasn't logged out, has it? <laughs> This one logged out though, didn't it? And when we come back to this case or another case later on, you'll see there's a, there's a bit of a pin number, quick code that we've already set up. So Rachel will put that in and we'll go up straight to the page. So two ways to get to safety, as we've mentioned. So this is April's thing. She's come, we haven't seen her, she's had benzos before. And the interesting, I'm gonna go through rather a bit more of the geography and then a bit more of the clinical stuff here. So Angela's mentioned at the top, for the doctors in the room, all your permits, all of them for all patients are up here. And so if you click on that, this one's a fake one, so there's no permits or anything. When I first logged in, I had a nice page and a half of permits. Half of them were inactive, like I'd cancelled them. Quite a few were still active. Some I knew of the patient, some I went, that patient died. Nursing home patient died five years ago. But because they died, and they forgot about them, and the permit was still active. So it was a nice little way when I first logged on to just clean up my permits, cancel the ones that weren't re relevant, and see. And for me, there was one patient that was prescribing some opioids longer term for um, that I didn't have a permit for. Whoops. But it was a way of checking, going, okay, get the permit in place, I made a mistake, didn't apply for one, but now I've got it, make sure. So it's a nice little check to see what your permits are. Correspondence is purely the correspondence, basically the permit letters. So there's not a lot of information there, but that's from the Department of Health. If we go to April's file, other parts over here, we've got three tabs, only one's active at the moment. That's the view history, that's what Angela was alluding to, and we'll talk a bit more about that later on. You can see who's actually accessed the file. So when it becomes mandatory, if there was a coroner's case or if there was a big issue, this comes to your question um, about what would happen if I don't look at it, probably nothing unless something went wrong. And if when something goes wrong, everyone's gonna look at the file and see who accessed it, what information it was. And because it is a legal requirement from April next year to look at this, and if April here had have died, the coroners, the police, the, the medical board or the pharmacist board, all everyone's basically going into safe and saying, all right, what, what did you find out? If your name isn't on here, then that's where we may be into trouble. But remembering this is not designed as a watchdog for us. It's designed as a tool to help us avoid overdoses. But there is a little bit of big brother around it if things go wrong. If you do things that you can justify, you've looked at it and you can justify it clinically, then you're not gonna get in trouble like we wouldn't get into trouble now. But if you do things very naughtily, or you're not looking at what you're meant to get the information, that's where problems can be. So there's anxiety about that, I understand that. But again, we take a step back from our anxiety, what's the big picture? It's about saving lives. And this has been shown internationally to make a difference. I'll talk about that shortly. Over here, we've got permits. That's blanked out at the moment because April doesn't have any permits. But if April had a permit, say from Phil Hegarty, in the middle there looking at me, April feels patient normally, um, but she's seeing me. I go into safe scripts, I see permits, got interesting, I click on there, and we had Phil's details there, what permits are available, so permit for morphine or what dates, expiry date, the whole thing. Then I, my approach there would be to, to speak to April saying, um, you need to go back to Phil because he's got your permit, I can't prescribe for you. That's the, what should be happening already, but we don't do that because we don't have this real information. The other bit here is uh, alert history. If she has any alerts, she doesn't have any alerts at the moment, but if she had those orange or red alerts, the history of those would be there, so you could always look at those rather than trying to skim through and find them down the track as well. Um, coming back to April's clinical situation, remember she, she saw her ages ago, benzos, we're looking at her, maybe she's in the waiting room about to come in, or maybe we're thinking about prescribing something, but we're seeing a history here of oxycodone, modified release. If we just go to dispensed events, this is what I do in practice, because that way it clarifies actually what's been dispensed, not just how many scripts are out there. Um, so I can see she's been dispensed three times. The dates here for those with well, those with excellent vision will see this, otherwise everyone else. Um, 
2nd of March, 13th of March, 20th of March, a packet each time. So those that are good at numbers know that those don't quite eat, eat, equate to the, what's actually been dosed here, which is one tablet twice a day. So already we can see here that she's been dispensed and assumed to be taking more than is prescribed. Now for that me, clinically, that's a concern. What's going on here and it needs more assessment of what's going on. So this is a trigger for a conversation. Not to say I can't prescribe for it or it's bad on it, but I need to understand what's going on. And there could be a number of reasons, but it's up to me to explore that and assess that. It could be a dependence issue. It could be her mother broke her leg and they can't afford any medication since she's sharing one and getting some extras. It could be a number of situations, but all that needs assessment. So I try and avoid judgment and trying to get a better understanding before I make my clinical decision from here. So, and putting myself in you know, your shoes, it takes more time. My God, I've got a conversation to have with a patient. But again, take a step back. What's it about? It's about if I prescribe this, it's becoming potentially, although there's no alerts yet, it's potentially an area where it's dangerous. And I may be contributing to that danger and that overdose if I don't have that conversation. So that's where I find my respons professional responsibility. But it is an extra conversation that we're not having necessarily at the moment. And I suppose that's the point. Because we're not having these conversations, people are unnecessarily dying, either because we weren't aware of the issues or the patient wasn't aware of the risks. And part of this is that conversation. We'll go back to the, we'll come back to small sex a bit later with a bit more alerts and excitement happening. April's a bit boring. The tip that I want to give you here is not so much, I mean, the, the, the important to ask, but it's not the words you're using, it's more the tone. You're going to get a much more, you're more likely to develop or not break rapport and get a more honest response if your tone has a couple of features about it. It also requires some privacy, the understanding of confidentiality, so there's some safety in the conversation. And for most GP settings, that's, that's a given, but you can make that explicit. Pharmacists, most of the time, it's not so explicit, so you may have to make it more explicit um, just because of the more public nature, but it's nothing that's not achievable. Um, but the, the tone, a couple of key things here. Non-judgmental language, really important. So you're keeping it just on the straight and narrow, talking about facts and not about judgment and interpretations of what could be happening. But the more important tip I'm going to give you here is your tone of curiosity. If you use that th thought, I'm going to be curious here, you change your tone. Samantha, why have you got three, three scripts in the last three, month, three weeks? Is a different tone than, Samantha, why? I'm just curious. Three, you've had three scripts in three months. And what's going on? It's, it's, it's a different tone. It won't give you the answer all the time, but you're much more likely to get an answer with an inquisitive nature of your tone. And be curious of what's going on. There's a story here. You know, it will be voyeuristic. I would like to hear what's going on. And your tone will change. Not as an interrogation, but as basically I'm here. And sometimes I get called out by patients about that, saying, why do you want to know? And I take a step back and say, look, I'm here purely, I'm not the police, I'm not the moral judgment, I'm not a priest or anything like that. I am here as your health professional. My sole responsibility is to make things as healthy and safe for you as possible and give you guidance around that. And part of my job here is to make any prescriptions or potential prescriptions as safe as possible. So I'm asking purely on that, that's my motive here, your health. It's a bit hard to argue, no, you don't care about my health. It's a bit hard to argue that as opposed to other judgmental things. So, Non-judgmental language is important here, but more importantly, that inquisitive tone just takes away a little bit of the to and fro. But the permission to ask, as you mentioned, is the most important first step. If you're not thinking about asking, you'll never find out what the story is. And for me, the story often gives me opportunities to treat the patient. The story I get out of these patients, or they give to me, gives me opportunities to treat. There is some distress often behind here, and it gives me an opportunity to actually be the health professional I've been trained to be. So it's not about me, it's about my patient making things safe. So tr treating doesn't mean prescribing, but it may be engaging in a heartfelt conversation of how distressing this pain is and how desperate the patient is and how frustrating it's been getting in the inquisition every single time and how we can improve things. Or about the insomnia or about the anxiety, how we're mismanaging or managing that. But it's conversations that now I'm now much more qualified to have than trying to be the police about what's right and what's wrong. 
So the conversation, the tone's really important. That's something that I'd like all of us here to try to do. It's hard to do sometimes. Sometimes we're not in the frame of mind. But when you can click yourself into that, I find myself personally, I get a much better response. And much less arguments, much less shouting. It doesn't prevent all of it, but much less. A bit more understanding, co-understanding. Now, the rules. I'll come away from the emotional parts of things and the consultation, but more about the rules. So the rules, and this comes back to your question about the patient who died, and can I access that information to find out what happened? Um, only involved in the patient's care. That's current care, not past care, but still could be past care. Um, you, there must be date of birth on this thing. Um, and for pharmacists um, doing Matod, so um, buprenorphine and, and methadone, your, how you record those is now a little bit different. It has to go through the software to go into safe scripts other than the separate software. Um, so a little bit different is there what's required. Um, there are some reduced requirements um, for SAT, and I'll get onto those in a short, shortly. So the regular requirements, you're only allowed to seek, and this is, this is a, a shortcut version, but the law basically, as it's been written, you're only allowed to access safe scripts for a patient under your care, which means they're involved with you, or you're about to see them, but there's something there. Just because your cousin's in Gippsland, you're interested in what, what the, what's going on there, you can't just go on. <laughs> or a celebrity and go on. That's illegal access, and that can actually be, there's quite hefty penalties around that, like most illegal accesses to health records. Um, so it has to be under your care. And it has to be under the guise of getting information in terms of making a decision about whether to prescribe or dispense drugs of dependence. So if it's a patient under your care coming out for a flu vaccination, a flu vaccination only, then by law, you still shouldn't be accessing this because it's not relevant at all to the flu vaccination by itself. Unless it became flu vaccination and sleep disorders and maybe I'm gonna, then you've got a clinical hook. So this is where this wouldn't be relevant because your patient's dead, so there's no actual need to check because they're already dead. So by law, you wouldn't be allowed to, but you know, there's nothing, would nothing stopping you, but someone, if there was a complaint, then you'd be in trouble. Now, this creates extra work for the doctors and the pharmacists, but for the doctors, it's extra work. And there's been a, a, a not a concession, an acknowledgement that safe scripts, because of the way it's designed to give us real-time information, overlaps a bit of the purpose of the permit system. So we now don't have to apply for permits if, and there's some clear guidance around this, if the patient is not drug dependent. If they're drug dependent, you must apply for a permit before you start, as it exists at the moment. You don't have to apply for a permit if your formulations are only oral or transdermal. Anything else, you must apply for a permit. You exempt if your total dose of morphine equivalents, if it's opioids, is less than 100 milligrams, it's not gonna go into the red zone. So if you're keeping your total opioid dose under, under, under 100 morphine equivalent per day, and it's transdermal or um, it's oral, and they're not drug dependent, you don't need to apply for a permit. Provided every single time you prescribe, you check safe script. So provided you're using safe script for what it's designed for and the law mandates us to do from April, then and there's other clinical criteria apply, we no longer have the burden of all those extra permits we don't need. But you will need permits for parental, you'll need permits for drug-dependent patients, you need permits for higher doses. So there's still some permit requirements, but it'll reduce the burden of permits significantly. But from when? From when, from now. So you can do that from now, provided you still look at safe scripts every single time. So the laws as of as now, you can do that now. You still may want to apply for a permit to have a bit more authority behind things for the patient's interaction, but you don't need to. No. So that, if you see one there, I always check that because someone obviously has got a permit who should be the regular prescriber. Um, it had to be very extenuating circumstances not to get around that. So there's some exemptions there. And again, we've got some links at the bottom which you'll never be able to read or type at the moment, but you, the, um, there's some resources we'll email out later on. Um, and they go through some more of the detail here that we can't provide in a slide or uh, uh, um, giving you verbally. In hospitals, um, at the moment, it's a bit difficult. The hospital systems are, are not as up to speed as community-based systems. So really, they're not feeding into the system anywhere near as, at, at the level we need them at this stage. But they've got until April next year to get their gear, you know, butts into gear. So at the moment, it's a bit hit and miss. Um, so nothing yet. They've got a web portal access still available to them how much culture change within a hospital is required for everyone to, who's prescribing and dispensing to be utilising it. A lot of education to come, but that's beyond the remit of today's workshop. Um, now, 
it's not mandatory within an emergency department or within the hospital. So consider emergency admissions as an inpatient. Anyone who's dispensed or prescribed something within a hospital environment, there's no requirement to check or upload into SafeScripts at all. That's sensible. You don't want every fentanyl little micro dose for every anaesthetic to be up here. You'd be just... So within a hospital, it's also very supervised. You'd hope there's no unintended overdoses in hospitals. Um, whereas outpatient stuff is a different story. So inpatient ED, so within a hospital ED setting or in hospital was fine. Once they get discharged, um, medications to come out into the community, they have to be within SafeScript itself. So like basically anything that's in the community is SafeScriptable, with a couple of other exceptions I'll talk about shortly. There's more information about hospital stuff, and there's a few people in the room from hospitals here on that website, and again, we'll have that link for you later on. But uh, most of us aren't inter integrating with hospitals, and they're a bit slow to come on, so I'll move on from hospitals, and any questions about hospitals towards the end. Now, there are other exemptions, apart from inpatients, um, any custodial medicine prescribing dispensings exempt, and also residential care is exempt, because they're meant to be highly supervised, and the risk of overdose in those settings is meant to be minimised, and actually is minimised compared to the community. The other one here is a change of wording, and I haven't got, haven't got the actual definition, but again, through those links on the website, um, there's actually a clear definition of what they mean by palliative care. And it's talking about palliation of end of life, it's changed from what used to be cancer-related pain was the permanent exemption. Um, and now, look, if I've got breast, or not breast, or breast cancer or other cancer, but I'm surviving, but I've still got pain from the surgery, that's still cancer-related pain, but I'm a survivor. I'm not going to have another 20 years of having cancer-related pain and be exempt from all the permits and checks. And we now know that a lot of people with cancer-related pain still have the same risk of overdose, unintended, but end-of-life palliation is a slightly different scenario where there's an expectation that as symptoms increase, if they're increasing, doses increase, formulations increase, and there's going to be higher levels of prescribing and dispensing for that end-of-life care. And there's exemption if you're, in that, if you're in that model of care for that patient, you don't have to check safe scripts in those, those things. But if you do that end-of-life palliation, I'd encourage you to go to the Department of Health SafeScript website and actually have a look at the definition of what that means. This is quite a tight definition, again, but we haven't been provided with that definition here. And, and it gets a bit, the conversation gets a bit mucky um, with all the different combinations of, of variations of experience that are in the room. Uh, again, if you've got questions at the end, come, come, come up and we can sort of help clarify that part of things. So exemptions where you don't have to prescribe, don't have to use safe scripts within regulated supervised settings or end of life. Everything else, um, there's a, it'll be mandatory to actually use it um, to, if you're consider, or if you're gonna prescribe or dispense. Now, in terms of privacy, a um, couple of points to make here. One, which we've already made a bit, a bit confidential conversation, but also a private situation. Uh, again, the advantage of being a GP, most of our consultations are in a private, you know, enclosed room, one-to-one, uh, -one, so that's given physically most of the time. Um, pharmacist, a little bit more challenging because there is a public interface at the counter. There's also a private counselling room, but how you get them there. You have systems in place, you should have systems in place already for the difficult conversations, the chlamydia script or the, the, the someone who needs some intimate screening or something. You, you, there are ways pharmacists are already having private conversations, um, not in earshot of others, making it appropriate. So this is no different. We need to make sure that it's forefront of our mind and not um, conveying, I've looked at say scripts, you've had five scripts in front of everyone else. That, that's unfair on the patient or the client um, in front of you. And also, I think it really a breach of their own privacy. So we've all got that responsibility. Um, and just making pharmacies often got a bit more logistical in terms of the, the geography. But there's nothing, we all should have a system in place. Um, and it'll pro probably already do, to be honest. Um, the other thing about um, patients, they're going to come in as Angelo, and especially early on, while they're not aware of this as much, of how did you know, what's going on, you know, feeling like they're being watched. Um, and so I show people on the screen saying, this is just a documentation of what everyone in Victoria, or actually everyone in Australia, is getting prescribed or dispensed on drugs that we know can cause an overdose. So I'm going to make my decisions on the information we've got here, um, including the information you give me, but this is part of my decision making. And the idea of it is to make sure that I can prescribe, if I choose to prescribe, I do so as safely as possible to minimise the risk of overdose. That's sort of, I mean, that's paraphrasing a conversation. It's not about oh my goodness, it's terrible, get out of here. Because for me, well, that sort of protects me in the present moment. For the patient, there's a lot of stigma and judgment around that. I think it's unhelpful. 
Um, but also, they're going to go to the next doctor, next ph you know, pharmacist, whoever the next one down the line is, more than likely less qualified than I am, more naive, more anxious, more concerned. And so you, we're transferring patients to a, a lesser experienced practitioner generally when we kick them out. Now there's times where we can't, there's inappropriate behaviour, we've got to kick them out, but I, I would encourage us to, to not to be so reactionary and use the curiosity, explore what's going on and look for hooks that we can help patients. And the conversation may be, I will not prescribe these medications for you, but I really want to help you. It sounds like you're really distressed about your sleep. Can we talk about other, are you open to talk about other ways of addressing your sleep? There's an invitation there. The patient may not take it up. No, nah, get out of here and slam the door. That's fine. But there's an invitation at least. And it could be six months down the track where they're in real crisis. They think, well, that doctor at least listened to me. I don't kick me out. They might come back then. We plant seeds. They don't always sprout, but the, the opportunity is there. If we don't plant them, there's no chance. So we've got to give, the, I think, give people an opportunity by an invitation of a conversation. And if you're time poor, you could say, I'd love to help you with this. If you'd like help with your sleep, please book another appointment. We've run out of time today. But there are ways of doing that, offering help rather than just being a block. Stigma is really important here. And patients will come in with the stigma of their disorder, if they've got one. So having chronic pain and being labelled as a chronic pain patient is quite stigmatising, let alone if you've actually been labelled with uh, a substance use disorder or actually, God forbid, being called an addict. Highly stigmatising. And I'm sure all of us, myself included, in conversation have talked about drug addicts, drug seekers. When would they get clean, dirty? Terms like this that we use, unfortunately, commonly because we're part of our community. And the community uses these terms. The media use it, politicians use it. The helpful terms if you're looking at politics or media bites and clicks. But in terms of health of our patients, they're not helpful conversations. Stigmatised terms like this actually impede access to care and access to carers. Because you stop caring if you're like, labelling like that. So absolutely, there are people with an addictive disorder. And I would even stop that labelling and say they've got a substance use disorder, opioid use disorder. There's no one in the history of the world ever, 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 globally, with an addiction who set out saying, I wouldn't mind trying to get addicted to this stuff. No one has ever decided as a choice to get addicted. Certainly there are life choices that increase or decrease the risk of addiction. Sometimes they're not choices. Actually, most of the time, the situations, childhood abuse, poverty, you know, unemployment, a whole bunch of stuff that doesn't necessarily, you know, genetics, a whole bunch of stuff that isn't the person's choice, but through circumstance and through the availability of a substance and the ease that substance from their distress, they get hooked. And for some people, that becomes an addiction. If you think about opioids, I now reframe opioid addiction or opioid use disorder as a complication of your pain management. Like you can get constipation or nausea, you can also have a complication called addiction. You didn't want it, no one wants you know, nausea or diarrhea or constipation, but you get those side effects. This is like a rash. It happened because of the medication, and because of your circumstances, and it takes away some of the judgment. And it allows a conversation about this disorder to emerge, about how distressing it is, how desperate they've become, what the withdrawal's like, how much they've had to lie to their family and steal from their family, and now I'm getting a real history, as opposed to the manipulation and the deceit and the complete lack of engagement because I've judged them and they feel judged. And most of these patients are actually very anxious seeing all of us because of previous experiences. So part of my goal, to, no, goal's too strong a term, but one of my roles tonight really is to open up an area that maybe hasn't been opened up to you professionally, or maybe you have, maybe you're engaging really well and I'm reinforcing those things. But I want to challenge you to think, how can I extend my professionalism to encompass a population that's already stigmatised, already judged, and have got high health needs, but the health professionals aren't engaging because of our own biases and stigma. Think of it as a medical disorder, not as a legal, moralistic issue, and we're already in the frame of mind of being curious and helping patients. Some of you will be well skilled in this area. Most of you in the room will have, I don't know what to do with that information. But at the end of this will give you some resources and referral pathways where you can find that information and find that as referrals and support to help you. Because I'm not expecting everyone here to always be addiction experts. That's unrealistic and you know, it never will happen. But at least all of us should be, have it on a radar so we can help those patients who we do assess have these issues. 
because stigma is big and it is a barrier to us as carers and them to access us. If we can decrease that even by patient by patient, we're doing a great service for our community. Whenever I get a history of a substance or an addictive behaviour, it triggers me, and I'm a bit biased because this is what I do, but it triggers me to ask a bit more. Ask about other classes. Someone having trouble with their benzos? Ask about opioids. Ask about gambling. Facebook. Gaming. Other hypnotics. Um, other substances. You know, illegal. Cannabis. Alcohol. Nicotine. Because often a, a problem controlling one of those, not all substances, some of them are just behaviours themselves, is a high risk factor of having multiple things. And there's opportunities, again, for us to intervene and refer people appropriately to help their distress reduce. We all know, we all work in the community, social history is so important, both in terms of the clues that give us an, a, a diagnostic idea, but more importantly, the context our management's going to apply. So whether they're homeless or they've got five children at home, or whether they're working or not, or how their situation is, all important for us in terms of actually guiding us to the risk factors, but also what circumstances they're going when they're discharged from our care in a few minutes' time. Goes, goes without saying, psychological history is important. Cause or effect, you know, substances and, and issues can cause issues, or those issues can cause substance problems themselves. Practically, it doesn't really matter which one came first. You can manage both together, and often we have to manage both together because we can't tease out which one came first necessarily. Now, risk screening here is meant to, if I'm reading the speaker notes, meant to talk about using a risk opioid tool and scoring them and working out whether they're high or low or risk. But, you know, I, I want to change that slightly. I think using a tool takes away a bit of responsibility from us. Let's look at risk screening, looking at family violence, the risk of driving impaired, the risk of child abuse, the risk of falls, the risk of overdose. If we're doing that sort of um, risk assessment, I think we're doing much more of a service than we're filling out a tool saying you're high or low risk. Because everyone's at risk, really. Just someone, yeah, a risk will vary. No one's at no risk. Everyone in this room, if we gave you some opioids or benzos, you are at risk of an overdose. No one's absolved from that. We're getting some exciting happening, come on. All right, um, examination, thankfully, not much to do. Sometimes you'll look at injecting marks if you've got any hearing, uh, uh, symptom of injecting. You might look at examining for signs of intoxication or um, of withdrawal, but there's not a lot to examine necessarily. Um, most of this is in the history and the discussion. Um, and the other thing I'd like to implore us to do, which most of us are doing already for a lot of our other patients, in our assessment, assess the patient's understanding and their expectations. Sometimes I do this, I jump to what I think they want, and actually it's misplaced. And so asking them, you know, what, what are you expecting out of today? You've come in with this. And I've had some saying, I just want, I just want that drug. That's all I want. Uh, you can talk to all the like, you can give me all the gobbledygook about CBT and psychology. I just want the drug. You're quite honest with me. At least I know what the expectations are. Um, others say, look, I know you're not going to prescribe, but I'm not actually expecting that. I actually want someone to talk to. But if I immediately jump to, they want the drug, you're not having any drugs, what, you know, and being quite blunt about it, I'm not going to open up the discussion. So just again, open, be curious about why they're there and then explore that with them. Again, whether you do or don't prescribe, that's your clinical decision. You probably won't in a lot of situations, but you can do that kindly rather than um, forcefully. Straightforward stuff. I'm not gonna read that. You can read that later on if you're not sure what that means. Um, but we really wanna focus, really, if we're looking at insomnia, anxiety, and pain, which are our three primary disorders where most of these drugs are prescribed, not one guideline we've got has a medication as first line for insomnia, for anxiety or for pain, chronic pain, long, ongoing pain. Pain management is not first line opioids. Anxiety management is not first line benzos. Insomnia is not first line hypnotic. But our society's expectations and also the way we've been trained, it becomes forefront in the conversation's mind off often, not all the time. So I'd like us just to rethink of how we approach and, and just be able to reflect before we jump to the prescription to actually have this conversation about that li those lifestyle factors or the, those non-pharmacological factors that actually have, we know, the evidence shows, have a better impact, less side effects than actually the medications we're prescribing. So best practice, one prescriber, one pharmacist. A pharmacist and a prescriber and a patient is a triad that communicate with each other. I would love for us to come back in a year's time and I can quiz you all, and you can all name a prescriber or dispenser you know by name. 
and you're, you're catching up because you've been on the phone to them so often with your regular patients, you actually know each other by name. Wouldn't, how wonderful would that be? Because you could then actually have a conversation about the safety issues and not feel fearful of being told off or being ignored or whatever. So these conversations need to happen. And this is another part actually, I think is going to force us to do is to have a broader conversation rather than just our own thing, our own information and share this information with the other uh, providers. Um, just because in terms of smaller quantities, if you think someone needs a benzo for whatever crisis is happening now for, to help them with sleep for the next three nights, you prescribe times three. You don't prescribe a packet of 20 or 50 or whatever the, the formulation is. The PBS box, the box size and the PBS is not clinically relevant most of the time. Yet we prescribe maximum amounts just because that's easy. The software just shows us that. So again, think about what you're prescribing clinically and for what reason. And if it is a endone to get them through their physio, their one-off physio prior to their surgery on Saturday, but the physio is on Friday, and they just, it's too sore to move, but you want them to actually get moving for whatever reason, I'm making up a sort of story here, then give them one dose for that thing. Not a packet, because it's the packets that are left over in households that we know contribute to overdoses. So think about what you're prescribing and prescribe the right amount, which is usually a smaller amount more than a larger amount. A quick, so in terms of paying, um, yeah, it may vary. Um, so it could be the same amount, no matter what happens, or it could be a lesser amount potentially for some medications. Um, but for me, the risk of an overdose exceeds the risk of them being, not, they're not usually out of pocket more, the fact that they've, got, they've paid per, per pill, it's more. They might have paid $7 for that one pill rather than getting a, a whole bunch of pills. But again, it's what's clinically appropriate. That's my primary thing. Uh, sometimes you'll have an extra charge, breaking packets, and we've got to be sensible about what we're breaking. The most important thing for me here is firstly the clinical decision to do that. Secondly, the phone call to the pharmacist saying, is it okay? And most of the time with my relationship with my pharmacist, it's fine. But I think it's important to convey that. So they're aware of that. Um, and the conversation isn't just moved to someone else. I and mean, we're having the conversation with the patient. So that triad of communication is happening. Again, something is a bit different. I'm getting used to using, doing that, um, but I've never had a bad reaction from a pharmacist. And I'm hoping pharmacists don't get bad reactions from doctors if we're discussing. But I know what happens. It's personalities involved. We'll talk a bit about tapering, but I want to just talk about naloxone itself. Um, naloxone is something we under-prescribe, under-dispense, under, under, dispense, under If you had a patient who was at high risk of an anaphylaxis or had a history of an anaphylaxis, I'm hoping all of you are thinking EpiPen, 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 EpiPen. Hoping for God it would never be used, but it's there in case it's used. Tonight's talk, we talked a bit about higher risk medications and situations, combinations, multiple prescribers, higher doses. They're all risk factors for overdose. But in our minds though, because we've never had training in it, we're not thinking of naloxone, naloxone, naloxone. We're just thinking, oh, I'll just prescribe what I'm doing. So, I'd like us to think of higher risk situations, particularly people who've had a previous near, near overdose or an overdose, or in generally red alert things, so high doses, multiple combinations, medications, they're at risk of an overdose. Not intended, no one ever intends unintended overdoses, that's the nature of them, they're accidental. But if we can provide naloxone and the conversation that goes with that, and there's a great resource, um, which again is the links um, from the Pennington Institute that goes through one pages, for both us as providers of naloxone, educating us, but also printouts for patients and families of how to use it, when to look for it, how to prevent overdose, what signs to look for. It's, I actually really enjoy that conversation. It's, actually, it's a bit awkward to start with, but once the family member or the patient buys in that this is potentially risky, there's anxiety around that, but they're very open to, I don't want to die, or I don't want my, my son or daughter to die, and there's a conversation around that. And because I think I might be saving a life, but I'll never see that life saved, like I said with Samantha at the start, because they'll still come back to see me, hopefully. Um, there's an opportunity there. So I think overall, we are certainly, as a, as a, prof as a health profession over, over all, we all underutilise the naloxone. It's on the PBS. It can be provided from a pharmacy without a prescription. It costs a bit more that way. But it's available to us. And I think we, if we're assessing for high risk, consider naloxone as part of your risk management process, just to help minimise that risk. There's no point having an naloxone in your cabinet at work if the overdose happens in a bedroom. I'm going to briefly go through tapering, but quite brief. 
because the resources we give you give you much more information than we've got time for today. And a lot of this is pretty straightforward information. For benzos, Reconnection is our statewide service and they've provided some excellent resources for us as part of the Scripture rollout and we've also got some excellent services available to all of us um, for our patients who have trouble with their benzo control. So those that have become dependent on the benzos, want to come off their benzos, running amok with the benzos, whatever it may be, there is a service. The toolkit is excellent in guiding us through some things. Um, and Erin, you're from Reconnection. Can you turn up, look, look at the, you have to look at the camera. And uh, yes, there's a camera. Yeah, tell us more about your service and what you do. So um, my name's Erin, thanks Paul. Um, and I work as a benzodiazepine withdrawal counsellor at Reconnection. And we're a specialist service that works with people who have become dependent on their benzos or Z drugs. So what do we do? We work with the client and the prescriber so we don't have prescribers, we work with you, the prescriber, we work alongside you. What we do is develop a taper plan, we generate an actual reduction schedule, which often looks like a transitioning over to a dose equivalent in diazepam and then a gradual tapering from that dose. Perfect. Uh, and yeah, well, we go by about a 10% reduction around every fortnight with our clients. We offer CBT counselling um, to kind of manage the withdrawal process and any anything that kind of emerges throughout that process. So um, we are a statewide service. Currently, we're kind of, our sites are dotted around <laughs> Melbourne metropolitan locations. So our head office is in Malvern, but here we've got um, a site in Epping, as well as out in Melton and in Ringwood. But we also have someone posted out in Geelong just recently as well. Um, in saying that, we are statewide funded so we do also have telephone and video counselling available for people who are either more remote or actually just have limited capacity to get to one of our services. So I guess you want to know how you use us, how your patients come to us. It's direct. They call us. Our support workers do a screen with them and then they book them straight in. No need for a mental health care plan, no need to direct them to an AOD intake. They come direct to us and we are a completely free service. They do not pay anything. So if there's one message you take about reconnection is actually we're here to support you. And often there is a lot of ambivalence in people who have become dependent on benzos around how they're gonna come off. We're there to support you in having that conversation and managing you know, what comes out of safe script when you start to notice that there is some risks around the benzo use. We're free. Thanks, Erin. This slide here it basically talks about dose equivalence. It's in the toolkit, so it's just a snapshot from the toolkit. Helps us combine. So if there's a couple of benzos, a bit of clonazepam and a bit of tomazepam, you're like, what do I do with this? Helps you convert it into a diazepam formulation in terms of dose equivalence. Then you can wean off a single formulation rather than mixing long and short acting sort of stuff. Um, quetiapine, if someone's having trouble with quetiapine, um, which has also been shown in coronary data to be involved with overdoses as a contributing factor, not primary, but it's got a sedative effect and has been contributing um, to overdoses in Victoria. Then the taper is probably less stringent, but certainly if they've been taking it for longer, a dose reduction is important rather than a cold, cold shut off because um, there is a, a discontinuation syndrome withdrawal that can occur itself. But that's pretty straightforward in itself. In terms of opioids, the main thing, a bit like benzos, is to try and combine into a single formulation, an oral formulation or a transdermal one, but an equivalence of something that's long acting. You're scheduling your doses, no PRN doses here. This is basically a scheduled, regular, supported dose reduction over time. The actual rate will vary in your circumstances. This is something that's been proposed, but it will vary a lot depending on the urgency and, and what's going on and the, and the medications involved and the patient's wishes and your wishes. Um, if they've got severe withdrawal, we just hold off that withdrawal. So, and we might, you don't go back up. You just hold it until that withdrawal settles. Within a day or two, provide you're continuing it with a dose. And then you go back to weaning off, but just at a slower rate if you decide to wean off. Um, and sometimes you can't wean off. It's just clinically you need it or the patient's really struggling. Either you can refer for extra help or you may find a lower, safer dose um, to, to minimise um, the risk of overdose. 
So we're not suggesting everyone has to tape off their medications, but if you choose to, there are ways of doing that. There's some examples there that are in your files, and it's one of those slides I'm going to skip over because there's no point in reading that when you can read it yourself. And again, coming back to non-pharmacological things that are less risky, um, and we know that if the people are able to swap over, their quality of life improves, probably our quality of life improves as well, because we're dealing with less of the angst around these medications. Um, but we're trying to focus on evidence-based stuff. Now, if you want further information um, about this, this, these topics, the SafeScripts online modules are excellent in diving a bit deeper than we've been able to do tonight. Um, and they'll cover a lot of the information as well um, that's, that's reinforcing tonight. So there's online modules that take a variable amount of time to do, but you can do them in your own pace um, to get some more information if you wish to. For those patients that you assess as opioid dependent, so they've got an opioid use disorder, so they probably have cravings to use, they're having trouble stopping, they may be affecting other parts of their life, then the, the evidence-based treatment is basically using buprenorphine or methadone to help contain that part so they can actually rehabilitate themselves from this addiction they've, they've developed. Um, in Victoria, all doctors, everyone here at the moment, all doctors, everyone who's a doctor at the moment, um, can prescribe up to five patients using a buprenorphine formulation without having done any accredited training. The medication is simpler than warfarin and prednisolone. It's a simple medication. The complexity is the patient, but you've already got the patient with you, so you can't get rid of that. But the medication is life-saving. It's life stabilizing and people can recover from addiction using a medication such as buprenorphine. So I'd encourage you to look at that or consider that as a toolkit for patients that you may eventually look at safe scripts and assess, go, oh, they've actually developed a use disorder here. And you can actually help them directly rather than having to refer if you don't wish to refer. There is further training through the College of GPs, um, which pharmacists also attend at times to get more information about this. Um, if you want to do more than five suboxone pa buprenorphine patients, or if you want to use methadone as your tool of choice. Um, so there's further training if you wish to. And again, we've got links around that as well. Now, if you're not prescribing, so a lot of the time with safe scripts, you won't prescribe. You decide, no, no, I'm not doing this. I think the important part here is explaining some rationale behind the patient, not to develop a debate, but at least putting it forward for them of the reasoning why you think this is unsafe. And it could well be that their dosing at the moment is a higher risk of overdose and you're not wanting, willing to contribute to that. Just that clear statement may be enough, maybe, enough for a patient to pause and think, really, I didn't realise it was such a high dose. And more information can be provided at that stage. Again, SafeScripts is a tool to help reduce overdose. And sometimes it's the conversation, not the prescribing, that makes the most difference itself. But referral, offering help, planting the seed, all those things we talked about earlier are important if you're going to not prescribe for a patient, but still offer help and the help doesn't have to be always going to be a prescription itself. We've got a, a case, June Jones, a little bit more information looking at safe scripts we'll bring up. So you've already seen most of this, but we'll just have a look at June's history here. And the difference here, there's an alert history at the top. Oop. Um, we click on that, which refers to, there's only one there at the moment, if we close that. The alert history refers to this little thing, it's an alert. And at the alert here it says basically she's obtained medications from at least four providers in the last 90 days. So remember those higher risk alerts, doses above 100 milligrams of morphine equivalent, more than four prescribers, or the combinations of morphine or fentanyl and other, other drugs as well, they're all higher risk. It's been shown internationally if you have more than four prescribers or, or dispensers in a period of time like 90 days, your risk of overdose actually increases to a higher risk. In the States, when, we ask, when you ask me, why is this mandatory? Why can't we just look at this as we need to? In the States, it's really good because there's 50 different states that have got their own laws. So there's some that had this, this type of system put in as an optional thing. You can choose as a provider to use it or not. And other states has it as a mandatory thing. If you look at the amount of multiple um, provider episodes per patients when this is when it started optionally it was going along and optionally it went like this and went back up to back back to square one patients found providers that wouldn't use it so they went to them instead and people fatigued by using it and just stopped using it and, and in terms of overdoses it did a little bit of a drop but it came back up and made over time made no difference the mandatory states like New York the same things the actual provided multiple providers dropped like this 
Whew. And the overdoses didn't drop to zero but it's, and stayed there compared to other states. So there is a certain, we know this saves lives, we just won't see them save lives because they, they come back to see us. We don't know they would have died otherwise. So the alerts there, you can see that's red. It would have come up in your notifications if your software is linked in as in a red alert would have come straight in here. And so then we can look at this and, and the same information you go through who's prescribed, who dispensed where, and a conversation and a clinical decisions made. Doesn't mean you can't prescribe, but it means you have to have a discussion or at least a thought process about is this appropriate or not. So more information for makers that decision. We'll go back. <coughs> if you're not trained with Suboxone or Methadone or confident with your Benzo chaos management and reconnection is a bit far away at the moment and you can't access some things. There are other support services that are available to us. So there is the Safe Scripts Pharmaceutical Helpline, more for patients, for information. So if they've got questions about Safe what's going on, you can refer to them this rather than trying to be the expert about the system and they can get their questions answered over the phone. Um, the pharmacotherapy area-based networks are located and we've got um, a representative here for our network in the room. I'll get introduce her shortly. Um, this is a network that's basically a fairly new program over the last couple of years designed to help us in the community about mainly opioids but a lot of other alcohol and other drug issues as well. So Andrea, this is your, your, your time to shine. Who are you? What, what do you do? I'll be very brief. Um, my name's Andrea and I manage uh, one of the five pharmacotherapy networks in Victoria. So on your way out, we have a resource table. These are resources for the Northwest, but we have uh, GP support uh, for GP. So you can have some mentoring from a peer. Uh, if you're interested, you can have a clinical placement with an experienced prescriber to see pharmacotherapy prescribing in action. Um, and our main service that we provide is access to an addiction medicine specialist. Um, Dr. John Cook at Western Health, Drug Health Services. We have outpost clinics across the Northwest area. So if you'd like a, a management plan for a patient that you're a bit unsure of, um, might be a bit too complex for general practice, um, just to get some advice uh, to help you see them in the community and just manage any risks. So take some resource on the table. And some of the training that Paul mentioned, we've got flyers out there, RACGP and Pharmaceutical Society uh, pharmacotherapy training. Thanks. Um, other resources you may be aware of, the Drug and Alcohol Clinical Advisory Service, a 24 hour service you can phone. Any of us in the room here as a health provider can phone this service and get a drug and alcohol specialist, addiction specialist from Victoria. They're on call every day of the year to call us back and discuss the scenario. So a really useful clinical consult on the phone within, that was about five minutes he called back. So it's a pretty quick turnaround. They get paged and they call you back. Project ECHO is a Wednesday morning statewide teleconference, tele-meeting um, on a number of different opioid topics each week from opioids in pregnancy and opioids in different populations and combinations and overdose and a number of different subtopics. Um, so if you're available from I think 7.30 to 8.30 on Wednesday mornings, there's a live thing you can actually, so if you look up Project ECHO um, in Victoria, you'll be able to find uh, a site to register for that. Some really good information there, but unfortunately as a, a tele thing, it's only available in that sort of time frame. It's not as a recorded thing that's available all the time, but it's a weekly, weekly thing. So another really good resource if you're able to access that. The Medicines and Poisons Regulations Group, Department of Health, if, you want, if you've got questions about the law, the legal advice, the legislation, um, they can help guide that as well. And as Rachel mentioned at the start, you've all got a hand out about health pathways. This PHN basically designs a whole bunch of clinical pathways that allow all of us to have a better approach, if you're not sure, but the clinical approach and referral pathways that are localised um, on a number of topics. And these are the topics that are pertinent to this topic. So you can see it's not just one, number of different areas that you may think, oh, I'm just not sure who to go to or what, what I should be assessing, or what's the clinical scenario here. Um, each of these pathways will help guide you through that. So they're distilling information into a very palatable form available through the Health Pathways website. 